Hey guys, it's me again, Kamil Rückert from the Psychosomatic Student Group Riga. And in today's student lecture, we're going to talk about defense mechanisms or how we try to protect our ego from ourselves. The art of the day is The Sun by Hui Minyun, and in some way, his everlasting smiley faces illustrate best the function of these defense mechanisms or ego defenses. Since the term ego is coined by our favorite Dr. Sigmund Freud, uh, let's take a look at his definition first. If you're not sure what the ego, the id, and the superego are, pause the video and find a good explanation. There are plenty of videos out there. Freud introduced the word defense. Defense in the classic Freudian psychoanalysis is the protection of the ego against the demands of the it and the superego. As there are two opposing entities and have two opposing demands, they form a conflict from which the ego tries to protect or defend itself. In the beginning, defense mechanisms were mentioned, but psychoanalysis did not really care too much about them. The unconscious world was more interesting than the ego. After Freud's work on defenses, his daughter, Anna Freud, changed this. She reminded the analytical world of the importance of the ego. She further worked on these mechanisms and published a book in 1936 in which she divided them. Interestingly, this contribution, as well as some other changes, led to a shift in, this, in psychoanalysis, away from rigidly sticking to the unconscious and its drives, and emphasizing the ego and its defense mechanisms more intensely. In her book, Psychoanalytic Diagnosis, Nancy McWilliams mentions two reasons for using defense mechanisms. On the one hand, to protect ourselves from powerful, threatening feelings, usually anxiety, but sometimes overwhelming grief, shame, envy, and other disorganized emotional experiences. And on the other hand, the maintenance of the self-esteem. Modern psychodynamic psychotherapy does not only regard the defense function in a Freudian sense, but thus expands them to defend unpleasant emotions, um, help to protect transference processes, and protect our self-esteem. But keep in mind, these processes are terribly human, and we all do it. It is natural, important, and necessary, often even creative. Later in her book, she men mentions an interesting study by Phobe Kramer in 2008, reviewing seven empirical findings about defense mechanisms. These findings state that defense first functions outside of our awareness, thus being unconscious. Secondly, it develops in a predictable order as children mature. Thirdly, there are present in normal personalities, so all medical and psychology first semesters can calm down and remember that we are all just humans. Fourthly, they are increasingly used in times of st stress. Just remember how we repress or even have to repress a conflict in order to keep going, or we, have, or we regress into a childish longing for help, or saying, no, I don't want to do this anymore. Fifthly, they reduce the conscious experience of negative emotions. And sixthly, they operate via the autonomic nervous system. And I have to be honest here, the fact really amazes me, but I didn't find the time to read up on that. So feel free to look it up yourself, but I hope to make a little video about this point, um, as we are all keen to connect the mind and the body. And lastly, they become pathological when used excessively. We divide defense mechanisms in two groups, the immature and the mature, or the primary and the secondary mechanisms. Primary defenses involve a boundary between the self and the outer world, while the secondary mechanisms deal with the internal boundaries, the superego and the it, or the observing ego and the experiencing ego. In addition, it has something to do with the developmental stages. The primary defenses are associated with the pre-verbal stages of development. 
And as Nancy McWilliams mentions, they have a lack of attainment of the reality principle and a lack of appreciation of the separateness and constancy of those outside the self. Two examples can already be given. Denial and repression. One is primary and the other one is secondary. While denying simply means, well, this did not happen at all, or once doesn't count, repression acknowledges the unpleasant. It happened, but I will not pay attention. Splitting is another example for primary defense. It divides the world into black and white. It is believed that this is a process strongly connected to the nonverbal phase of development and could be said that primary defense mechanisms are those we believe the infant to make sense of their world. They are pre-verbal, pre-logical, imaginable and have magical qualities. The secondary defense mechanisms, on the other hand, are more mature. As before mentioned, they develop later in the life, as we grow up. Thus, they do not reflect the reality of an infant's world, but rather how adults make sense of the world and how they deal with their internal boundaries. This might be a struggle between the Freudian instances, ego, superego, and it. Um, for example, they use humor or intellectualization. Think, for example, how people tend to joke about taboo topics, such as sex sexuality, or nowadays maybe the gender topic. This may help in easing the conflict. They also deal with the observing and experiencing part of the ego. Or in other words, they protect our conscious understanding from the threatening emotional quality within us. Let's take a look at the primary defense mechanisms and try to find some examples. Um, I will just give you some examples for both groups, but keep in mind there are many more, and this is just a short presentation, but if you're interested, you can read up yourself, and in the end of this lecture, I will give you a short uh, um, recommended reading list. Withdrawal refers to retreating into oneself or pulling away from reality. You might see daydreaming on the healthy end or as a creative process of writing a novel. On the unhealthier part, it is seen in psychotics as severe withdrawal or as social withdrawal. It is characteristic for schizoid personalities. These patients tend to retreat themselves from society and their peers. Denial, as mentioned before, is rejecting the fact that something happened. It didn't happen, thus I don't have to care, might be the response of a young child. Yet adults do this too. Even though it is primary, we all use these de defense mechanisms. We might deny an insult from an acquaintance, or we deny an illness. I don't have diabetes, or I don't have cancer, are problems many doctors have to face. Omnipotent control refers to belief, the belief during the developmental stage of newborns. It is a sense that one can influence the environment. A baby is hungry and suddenly, due to the crying, the mother appears. It is thirsty and a breast appears. The baby thinks he controlled this appearance or this happening. The omnipotent control remains in us. On the healthy side, we think we succeed in life due to our sheer willpower, as we could achieve anything we set our minds to, disregarding luck or our social backgrounds. On the unhealthier end, antisocial personalities try to seek and enjoy the sense that they have ex exercised their power. This I made him do this drives them away from anxiety and helps in maintaining their self-esteem. Idealization and devaluation. We all idealize in our daily life. Think of your first love or what we refer to as the honeymoon phase. The partner is perfect and a superhuman, similar to how a child would see the parents. 
As we grow older, we de-idealize our parents and after a while we do the same with our partners. Narcissistic patients use these two mechanisms quite a lot. In order to live with their fragile self-esteem, they tend to idealize themselves. Often with objects such as powerful people, expensive goods, and at the same time, they have to devaluate others. Look at this weak person, says the narcissist, to not have to look at its own weakness or fragile self-esteem. Projection is the process of attributing what is inside to the outside. A person who is angry or is sad might see this in other people but not himself. Introjection is the opposite. Feelings outside are misunderstood as coming from within the self. In psychoanalysis, this process can be seen in identifying with the aggression, aggressor. In fearful, threatening times, people try to identify with the abuser, thus turning themselves into the strong, powerful persona, rather than staying in the situation. Arno Grün wrote a book about this topic, connecting modern terrorism with the identification with the aggressor as well as making a connection between obedience and the before mentioned. Both projection and identification do not need a relationship between the members or between the subject and the object. Projective identification in contrast needs a connection. It is a term coined by Melanie Klein. And it is a bit hard to explain, and I try to make it as simple and short as possible. Projective identification involves two parties. The subject, which projects his or her emotions, let's say anger or sadness, onto the object. And this object, which does not agree. And due to this disagreement, the subject might say, see, now you made me angry, or... Now I am sad because you're disagreeing. Thus the feelings that were already within the subject become present, yet in a distorted way. The subject identifies with its own projection. Dissociation involves disconnecting oneself from the present experiences. This can even go so far that the person will create another representation of itself to a point that involves having a different personality. In a more benign form, it recesses access stimuli. In splitting, the ego defends itself by separating the world into good and bad. All women might be bad and all businessmen might be good. It reduces the complexity of life but leads to a distortion of reality. It often switches quite rapidly. The person who was amazing and wonderful becomes pure evil the next day. This can be observed frequently in borderline patients. The last of the here mentioned primary defense mechanisms is somatization. As we have been through this already, I'll make it short. Somatization describes emotional states being expressed physically. The ego tries to defend itself to maintain the self-esteem or to protect itself from threatening overwhelming feelings by shifting the attention to clinical symptoms. And here's a short overview of secondary defense mechanisms. Again, there are way more, but we want to keep this lecture short and give you a short overview. Repression in contrast to denial does not recognize the emotions but shoves them away. Thus, it becomes more mature. I know it happened, but I will not deal with this right now. Bad news like diseases, bankruptcy can be repressed. Regression is something we have already learned during the video of psychosomatic theories. It simply means that one turns to a younger, more infantile version of oneself. The infantile behavior protects the person from dealing with the threatening emotions. Think of the gain of illness or a hospital patient who is being nursed back to health, just like the mother nurses a child. 
Separating emotions and thoughts is referred to as isolation. It is often seen in doctors, especially surgeons. They need to isolate themselves from their emotions when cutting a patient open or removing a tumor. Because after all, it's another human being and it's scary. It could have been emotional. Oncologists and other doctors frequently do this too. And it is referred to as a subgroup of dissociation, yet more mature. Intellectualization is the shift from the emotional area to the intellectual theoretical area. I don't want to learn because this topic doesn't interest me, can be heard from many students. And at the same time, it is often at the core of our Western society, our philosophy and our modern culture. And rationalization, threatening fearful emotions, are unconsciously reimbursed by a logical explanation. A student who did not study for an exam and failed it might say something like, oh sure I failed, but the professor is such a mean person and he doesn't like me at all. Turning against the self refers to the idea that unbearable emotions are turns against oneself. It is the redirection of emotions to the self that were originally directed towards someone else. Imagine you depend on someone, and he or she is not there for you. It might be easier to turn your criticism and rage against yourself. This can be purely emotional, or even expressed physically by a patient cutting him or herself. And one of the most interesting and often fought against defense mechanisms in order to pollute psychoanalysis is reaction formation. The idea is that threatening emotions are replaced by the opposite in order for an individual not to have to deal with the, them. It might be a girlfriend telling all of her friends how wonderful her boyfriend is in order to not see his negative and cruel ways. Or overwhelming hate will be transformed to love. Do you remember that overly friendly and nice person in your past or maybe in your present? Well, Anna Freud wrote in 1936 that the new formed emotions or the new formed emotion is often overexpressed. Overly friendly and happy people often seem to us as if they are hiding deep sadness and anger due to the overexpressiveness of their emotions. Sublimation is finding diverted and adaptive satisfaction from those impulses that cannot be expressed directly due to social norms. Can you imagine a person not being allowed to express his aggression might become a wrestler, a butcher or maybe a surgeon in order to get his satisfaction? So let us summarize what we have learned. The main function of defense mechanisms is to maintain our self-esteem and to protect our ego from overwhelming and threatening emotions. All defense mechanisms are unconscious when we use them. They may or may not become conscious after using them or during therapy. We all use them and it is normal to use them. As we all have, we all sometimes deal with overwhelming emotions. And maintaining your self-esteem can be quite tough in our present world. Defenses become pathological when we stick only to a limited variety of them. And when only primary mechanisms are present. Why? Because this causes stress to the ego. And rigid defenses make it harder for the ego to defend itself. Often this leads the person to therapy. And here are my sources and my recommended reading. Uh, you can take a look at them. Nancy McWilliams' book rose to a certain fame. And it is, very, it is a very good read, but it requires psychoanalytical knowledge or an academic supervisor if you're a student just like me. If you want to go to the beginning of defense mechanisms, Freud and especially his daughter Anna Freud are the place to go. Anna Freud book is one of the most comprehensible psychoanalytical books I have encountered and if you're just looking for a very short overview 
uh, take a look at the website of Consulta Apeland. They basically summarize Nancy McWilliams topics. Thank you guys for listening. If you want to learn more about us, see our faces or our work, click on our website and make sure to follow our YouTube channel.